but for day, today I thought it was probably best I introduced myself, um, amplifying a little bit the very nice remarks that have been made already, but explaining where I stand vis-à-vis um, -vis, uh, musical literature, history, performance, reception, your part in the process, and so on. Usually, if a journalist asks me how I spend my time, I will say that I'm 50% a performer and 50% a musicologist. Um, it's not strictly true, though, if one had more time to expand on that, I suppose one should say one is 100% both of those, because there's no way you can switch off your um, sort of academic musicological interest when you're performing, and no way um, you can suspend all notions of performance when you're sitting in the dusty library. So although I would aim to be um, a performing monkey for half the year and a dusty um, academic for the other half of the year, the two necessarily mingle. And my ideal, I think, is to keep them both, um, juggle them so that they are both in the air and available all the time. In both these categories, there's a degree of interpretation. Uh, both in musicology and in performance. And it's, it's a question of what you're interpreting. You're taking historical evidence, you're taking ancient instruments, you're taking old uh, notations and scripts, or you're taking more recently printed music. Uh, you're dealing with all the signs and symbols that give you a clue as to what the original composer intended, but they are never a complete recipe. It is a form of cookery, and you have to devote yourself to uh, the details and the balance of fact and imagination and whether it's in a live performance or in making sense of some of these scribblings on the page and making them sufficiently sensible to turn into music that you would enjoy they all have to be interpreted some people will say um, there is a school of authenticity involved in this I'm a little bit suspicious of this word Lionel Trilling dealt with authenticity very nicely as a, as a literary form when it was applied to music rather casually um, way back in the last century. Um, it was a sort of catch-all phrase, meaning that you somehow took a closer look at history than your colleagues had been used to doing in advance of performing the piece you were going to perform. But it's very hard to say that when nearly everybody, in fact, is playing historical music. If you calculate the number of people who play contemporary music uh, mainly or exclusively against the number who perform music of the past, you can easily see that we, we live artistically in a complete museum of musical history. And therefore, authentic is only how convincing you can be according to your own lights. And the newer emphasis that's been put on faithfulness to the composer's lights um, is very interesting and can be developed so far. It doesn't cut out the individual. I'm still in there even when I'm puzzling over what Brahms or Mozart or William Byrd meant by that scribble on the page. It is a question always to people involved in the recreative arts. Are you actually recreating or are you merely reproducing? Um, is it a form of, what is this new wonderful serial? Downton Abbey, Downton Court. Um, somebody introduced me the other day as being the Julian Fellows of the music world, I suppose, <laughs> faking up all the historical details and then having lots of people um, writing in to say you got the details wrong. That's essentially, I suppose, what, what performing musicology deals in, and we hope we don't get too many details wrong, but we also hope there is plenty of new discovery to be made. To begin the process when you face a piece of music, I think it's very useful not to come with an empty historical mind, but to come with some idea of how that piece came into being. Um, it's pointless going to the marriage of Figaro without knowing something about the social conditions that gave rise to the Beaumarchais play, which gave rise to the Mozart opera. Um, it's also, I think, important artistically to have some notion of where the piece you're listening to stands in the process that went on in the composer's mind. Just a few examples, I think, are, 
um, quite useful to us. Um, if you listen to the uh, Beethoven's F major symphony number eight, it always begins very beautifully. It's useful to know just from the way that starts that until the very last moment, Beethoven had prefaced it with three loud chords. Bang, 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 chum, da 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 ding. Relief for and from the loud music. When you hear uh, Mendelssohn's Italian Symphony, for example, um, I've recently been doing a lot of editing of Mendelssohn and following the process that he went through. Um, he rewrote enormously. He even told his sister that he suffered from a disease known as Revisionskrankheit, uh, a sickness for um, correcting anything that was put in front of him. Well, we started putting out uh, for the public and for recording purposes version A, version B, version C. Um, a lot of dispute, of course, straight away, saying why do we have to have version A and version B when we have the final version, the Fassum Lesterhand. Um, Good question, except a lot of people and Mendelssohn's own colleagues and family and friends sometimes felt his first version was the best and he, um, in consecutive versions, spoilt it as he tinkered with it. Uh, the same view holds, some people will say, for J.S. Bach. Um, th the vision was quite fresh at first and then was overworked as it became more and more complex in rewrites. But um, a greater example, I think, is the fact that you ask people, do you enjoy uh, Mendelssohn's Italian Symphony? Yes, they say, wonderful piece. Do you know it's not the version that he last left? Oh, really? And then you play them the final version, which is not normally played, and everybody says, oh, that sounds like an early version. I really much prefer its predecessor. So the idea of process uh, going on through the music is already contentious and I think very useful in this day and age and particularly in this day and age with um, the ability to compare and contrast on recordings you have uh, the possibility to look at this process in practice. A changing picture therefore is much more interesting I think to the musician, the music lover, the amateur and the professional rather than a static version. When it comes to actually putting uh, music down on the page, creating an edition um, then you do have to balance these things up and as I say you have to be honest about what the composer wrote, what he failed to write, what you think he should have done, what you think he meant and also what his first and second thoughts were. Sometimes you get imaginative people who look at a, a Handel Concerto Grosso and say I think I can improve on that, you know, I'll, I'll do this instead, it will sound much nicer. It's a, a great uh, break on their over active imagination I think to say wait a minute if you look at the manuscript you'll see that Handel did think of that and that was what he wrote first of all and then he crossed, crossed it out and he put this more elegant simpler stated piece um, he had the same thought as you and he vetoed it and then they look a little chastened and come back to, to <laughs> playing the text and not trying to improve um, Performance of early, earlier music than music of our own day is very much a journey into the past and that's why I stole the L.P. Hartley uh, little statement about the past is another country. They do things differently there. And a lot of um, performers immediately turn around and say, yes, the past is another country and we no longer have a passport or visa to visit it or um, you know, we're exiled from this age. It's not suitable to us anymore. I think this is untrue, but I do think that you have not to make too many assumptions that something that works now and is expected now is necessarily what your grandparents, your great-grandparents, people in the 19th, 18th, 17th century expected at that very same juncture. And so what I'd like to go through in this lecture is just a few examples of um, what we might put together under this nasty... Uh, heading called reception history, um, how we um, look at the way music has been treated and received and judged prior to the present day and what we can make of this evidence. Um, recordings are our greatest ally in this and it is, I think, something that should be much celebrated 
that now that the recording industry has lost its fascination for always the latest and greatest technique and instead looked back at its legacy of over a hundred years of recording, we can begin to be our own researchers. Now, any one of you, for the price of a CD, can go out and recreate at home a musical experience way before you were born. We at last had the chance to have oral evidence of what went on um, in addition to what we hear in live concerts nowadays. Um, it gives one, I think, an increased regard for, at least an, um, an increased knowledge of what goes on in the background of historically informed performances. And we also have to be a little bit careful. It requires um, self-training to cope with some of the parameters of the earlier recordings, what you make of them. I'll give you a little example. I thought it would be worth, since a lot of what I will be doing over these lectures will be illustrated partly by live performers on this very stage, but partly by uh, recorded excerpts to know um, how the recordings began and what people first heard. Here's um, the earliest music recording, um, which I don't think you will make very much out of. I will tell you it's the Crystal Palace and it, the work is by Handel, but just listen to this. Israel in Egypt. Um, it was the first um, Edison recording that came over and the, the English agent for Edison took it along to the Crystal Palace. This was June 1888 and the choir that's singing is more than 3,000 people, although they're much disguised behind the surface noise. Um, and interestingly, the Victorians kept very uh, clever uh, records. You might like to know that the audience was 23,722 people. Um, here's a little sample to give you more clue. This is a modern recording of that same little snippet. see that the uh, Crystal Palace version very obviously was three times slower uh, than that. Listen to it again and um, we may hear more in it. sang very slowly in these big <laughs> moments in the Crystal Palace. It's not, it's not essential, everybody knows, with a large choir you can go fast. Uh, we've heard Hollywood Bowl performances with a thousand in a choir and they can go as fast as a chorus of 25. Uh, but it tells you at least um, that monumental fact about Victorian interpretation. Um, slightly later recordings I think can fill in gaps which for us are more perplexing in the process of resurrecting Baroque music. One of the most um, difficult chasms to fill, of course, is that the vocal 
soloists of the Baroque, the famous singers who sang for Handel, for Vivaldi, for all the operatic performances of the Baroque in theatres all over the world, um, including performances um, way outside Europe. Um, the star voices would be either female sopranos or male sopranos, castrati. And the works um, of all Handel's operas and all his contemporaries were built round the availability of specific, terrific voices, people like Farinelli, um, who drew the highest salaries ever heard of in the music business, tended to gravitate to London where people had more money to blue on this sort of thing, and delighted the operatic world with their warblings. We don't have a chance to know what quality of voice this really was. But recordings can come to our rescue a little bit, and this is where your, your training in what to listen for and what to um, ignore in the performance um, can be useful, because they come... The price of, of, of these early recordings is they, they come very much preserved in the, the amber of their time. The wrapping paper around them is very much of its period. Um, but here is the sound of a castrato. This is the last castrato to sing in the Sistine Chapel. He was called Alessandro Moreschi. He was born in 1858. Um, he, he made this recording, um, it's Guno Ave Maria. So you all know the accompaniment, it's the Bach prelude. And the voice over the top is definitely a voice of its time. This was recorded in 1913, so he was um, 55. He was also terrified of this modern mechanism. They, they had to really hold him down in the studio in front of this machine because he was sure something horrible would happen. So when he begins, he's clearly breathless and he can't sustain a long, long phrase. Um, if you can overlook the quality of the recording and secondly the stylistic mannerisms of the time, though do note them, a lot of swooping, a lot of very elastic tempo, the accompanist has to almost stop while he hangs on to an open and go forward, all the flexibility that was expected in the late 19th and early 20th century is all there. Behind all that though, there is an extraordinary voice and anybody at the age of 55 who can pitch a top B that many sopranos would be very proud of at 25 and sustain it, has something going for him. The other thing I think is very noticeable as well as the quality of the voice um, and a very positive aspect is the sheer passion of the delivery. This is a religious piece and we are not, I think, used to hearing religious music put over with quite, quite so much passion. Uh, this was a man who served all the life, of course, in the Sistine Chapel as a servant of the church and the Pope. And uh, here he is, slightly terrified, giving you the only chance we have, really, of hearing a castrato voice behind these other layers of history.
to extract from that the quality of voice, some of the technique. Uh, interestingly, how, noticing how little vibrato he uses, and, and then splice that in your mind back onto a, a slow handle aria or something like that, subtracting the stylistic devices of the time. Uh, to us, of course, it sounds a little bit extreme, but they are part and parcel of the history of music and the interpretation that composers expected. Um, if you make a jump now from um, the, m the music of the Baroque requiring that voice to those same interpretative devices used on music when um, it was contemporary with that style. Um, here's a sample of the same sort of interpretative tricks, the, um, the elasticity, the very controlled vibrato, but particularly, and I think most noticeably, on that recording and this next one, this portamento, the sliding from one point and sliding upwards and down. Nowadays, we're very much brought up on clean playing. We forget that um, Brahms and all the colleagues at that time in the 19th century through to the 20th century until the 1930s and 40s would have used that as an expressive device, the, the dirty shift as it were, so you can hear the interval. Here's Elgar conducting a piece which has been terribly maligned by its connection, I think, with royal funerals and things, Nimrod uh, from Enigma. It was his second recording of this, it's 1926, so only a few years later than the uh, Moreski recording. And you hear all those tricks in play, very elastic tempo, some very slow, a lot of speeding up, uh, a lot of sliding, and a wonderful disregard for his own score. Because when he, when he, um, when he suddenly says um, uh, retardando, he goes very much faster. And at other, other moments, when you know, he, he treats every performance new, and the, and the orchestras that played for him said, exactly, you never, never knew what was going to happen when Elgar directed his music. It was always musical, but it was never like yesterday's performance.
Thank you. I was just pruning a little bit too much in the base for the speakers. And I think that's a very good example of absolute expressiveness, very free expression, and absolutely not sentimental. There's, there's minimum sentimentality there. It's not a funeral piece. Very nicely delivered. And you can compare that with the previous recording Elgar made. The technical tricks um, are exactly the same. That was the style he was after. We have the, his own evidence for it. It should be, therefore, part and parcel, I think, of the tricks that a modern orchestra and conductor should be able to deliver in order to, to give a, a stylistically correct version of that late romantic music, the same as we make every endeavor to have Renaissance, medieval, and Baroque music delivered in the style considered correct for it at the time it was created. What we also have on, on record and absolute evidence sometimes is the composer himself telling us about things. Here's a little snippet. Um, we don't have Elgar speaking um, about his own works. We don't have Bach or Mozart telling us how to rehearse their music. We do have Aaron Copeland who comes along to a New York studio to record um, the chamber version of Appalachian Spring and in the process we discover quite a lot of things about what he wants and what he <coughs> thought was in his music that wasn't there from what he asks the players to do. This is absolutely in addition to the information given by the printed notes that you purchase and play from. Good afternoon. Hi, how are you? I assume everybody knows this piece. Only by reputation. <laughs> a warm, soft, warm sound without any sense of effort. And a sort of a non-committal clarinet sound. One, two. Yes. Could you do it without any sense of diminuendo on each note, if possible? D, da. Here we go. Yes. I give a sort of a cut off and beep. Yes. Here we go. Right there at the attack. Six. Yes. Would you mark a crescendo on the A with the fermata? Yep, that, 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 I'm used to that. I don't know where it came from. But. <laughs> Six again. There isn't so much loudness as sort of bounciness that I was looking for. Da, da, de, ya, da, da. Um, yes, that crescendo should go into everybody's score when they're doing Appalachian Spring, as he said. He didn't know where it came from, but he likes it. It wasn't printed. Um, a little bit later, there's, while he's busy correcting this over-expressive playing, these violinists who make nice shapes on long notes as taught in the conservatoire, you know, just straight, um, without, without effects. Um, he has a very nice phrase saying, he's stopping them playing, saying, it's too much massonade, too much massonade. <laughs> <coughs> so, there he goes. Um, all these things add up to evidence that the, um, uh, what's now called the hip movement, I think it's rather a nice phrase, Andrew Porter invented it in the New Yorker. Hip performers means historically informed performers. So, <laughs> it's, um, it's a nice halfway house between the old emphasis that you had to play everything on exactly the correct original instruments and you had to try and resurrect 300 year old soprano tone in order to let that do the job for you. It is, in fact, is not done for you by the instrument, it's something in the head and you can be historically informed and still playing a not absolutely precisely appropriate instrument but the performance can still have a deal of style. This let a lot of orchestras, of course, off the hook um, because you can have a historically informed performance of baroque, classical or romantic music from an orchestra basically equipped to play music post Bartok, providing everybody is aware from the evidence of history and from recordings and from 
um, every printed source that's available and from the activities of the, um, the people who do specialise in period instruments to know what the framework is within which you can interpret and how not to overflow these, um, the boundaries of appropriateness um, as laid down by what history we have and it may always be a changing target. It's something that requires I think education from early on. Part of the problem I think with um, public engagement with music nowadays is that we're very much wowed by the, um, the PR machinery and we've in a way lost the ability to make our own decisions on whether an interpretation or a performer or a piece of music is um, any good at all, moderately good or absolutely marvellous. And the solution surely begins with education and the point at which the idea of um, musical appreciation and the academic path separated. They in fact should never really separate, um, as I said at the beginning. If one can try and hold these two together, the, the performer and the academic, the informed listener, you, um, as well as the informed performer so that you can speak the same language, um, that's something that should begin uh, early on in musical teaching and it shouldn't be subject, I think, to the, um, the PR campaigns elevating certain things above others. You should be free to make up your own minds. One very easy category, I think, on which um, we tend to have jaundiced views is the business of arrangements. Um, the minute I mention arrangements, everybody goes tut tut because they think if you're a historian, you don't deal in arrangements. You deal only in the original thing. But there are arrangements and arrangements. You have Mozart arranging Handel. Well, that tells you a lot about Mozart and tells you something about Handel too. Um, here's a little sample of a composer uh, deciding that his very nice music could do duty in another format. You know this piece very well, but probably not in a choral version. another piece that's been hijacked by state funerals. Um, they're doing, making a very nice uh, choral piece, an annus dei, and I think filling a slot, one needs more and more church music of such quality nowadays, and that's uh, an arrangement by the composer, condoned by the composer. Very close to it um, is another type of arranging which would have brought you into the picture much more in the 18th or 19th century than you get nowadays. That is, any new work that circulated mostly would have circulated in the form of arrangements for home consumption prior to the wonder of these recordings that we're enjoying so much now. Um, you had to learn your new Mozart symphony, your new Haydn, your new Brahms, your new Beethoven in the form of a piano duet or a, a string quartet adaptation or a... Um, some, some format, I actually have a version of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony for two flutes and guitar. Um, so you can reduce some things to really surprising uh, combinations. But you did then have a hands-on experience. You probably didn't get much of Beethoven Nine if you were a guitarist, I suspect. But um, you got to know the piece formally. You got to know them. If you were playing uh, piano duets, as everybody knows, you play the the left-hand part, you really get to lo know a lot about what the viola does in the middle of a classical symphony in a way that you don't by just sitting in the concert hall. And the, the value, I think, and the, the importance of reviving an interest in these arrangements is very high. They were either by the composer himself or by friends, colleagues, and or at least contemporaries. Um, Haydn's symphonies were arranged down from their big version that only a few Londoners heard while Haydn was performing them here 
to a chamber version and uh, described um, by uh, Sam Wesley as uh, these certain invaluable works, he said. Um, this was in a London public uh, music lecture that he gave. Invaluable works originally constructed for a full band that have been very ingeniously contracted for the convenient accommodation of small musical parties. Amongst them, let me instance, 12 delectable symphonies of Haydn, which have been reduced from the score with extraordinary ingenuity and accurate judgment by the late accomplished and energetic master of his art, John Peter Salomon, and nicely adapted for two violins, viola, cello, flute, and a supporting accompaniment on the pianoforte. from the days when playing music didn't mean just setting your iPod to random. Uh, <laughs> you actually went and played it. And the whole concept of private music, music played at home, not with a career in mind, but for fun, um, needs very much to be emphasized and encouraged. Now, it also means that you can bring back things that have been forgotten, like the piano duet, but also instruments, the lute. Uh, the clavichord, all of them private instruments that do not hold up very well in the Albert Hall, uh, but are perfect in your sitting room. And they give you an insight, even if it's an amateur insight, into music which you then go out and recognize and can, out of your own personal evidence, discuss and assess. Um, two final examples I'd like to play, simply to give guidance um, in this year of Chopin, because I think, I don't know if you are also as disappointed as I am, that we've had a year celebrating Chopin with endless identikit interpretations of familiar pieces. As far as I know, not a single big discovery of anything valuable and very, very little um, attempt made to transfer Chopin back to his own time, to his own instruments. For somebody who was so devoted to particular brands of piano, it's such a shame that we have to hear nearly everything um, played on the Monster Steinway and in a style which really uh, says, you know, look at me, I can play the etudes, look at me, I can um, massacre a little mazurka. Um, <laughs> how to find a different bearing? My suggestion is, let's go back to um, um, a pianist. Uh, we don't have Chopin on record, but one suggestion I would make to plug the gap is the, the work of a pianist who um, was a, a young prodigy, uh, studied with Talsig, uh, came from the Ukraine, uh, played around the major centres of um, Europe for a number of years, studied for two years with Liszt. So here we have Liszt's, uh, one of Liszt's last pupils. Um, went away to study philosophy, so um, not given to the bright lights, and afterwards came back to a playing uh, career. But um, somebody who could turn a mazurka so exquisitely um, all the tricks that you've heard from earlier 19th century performance can be there in this, but um, I think there is a, 
a finesse of rubato, how much can you stretch and push and pull on this. Also, how can you modify the tone of a, of a piano to really sing. This is Moritz Rosenthal. Um, playing a um, mazurka, Opus 50, number two, for those who want. would learn how to end pieces as simply as that. It's a marvellous example, I think, of, and we can all play that mazurka. It's not at all difficult, but how to get it so affecting um, and so pure and, again, rather like the Elgar, not a, not a moment of sentimentality. It's just expressive, and when it's said what it needs to say, it exits without any fuss. I think um, we're sometimes just dazzled by the, the sheer virtuosity that goes on around us now with all the... Um, Lang Langs of the world. As the critic rudely said, he carries an encore even in his own name. Um, <laughs> so you could see judgment was already made. Up. But it, there does seem to be a competition now that all Russian pianists have to play louder and faster than all Chinese and vice versa. Um, and so this, this general barnstorming, particularly on, on technically difficult things, um, we managed to lose sight of the fact that the great technicians, people like Liszt or the nearest we can now get to list, pupils of list, could deliver these barnstorming pieces um, with a smile. There wasn't a lot of sweat, and I'll end with um, a recording of, of Moritz Rosenthal playing the, the first of the etudes, the C major one, which Horowitz said was the most frightening of all the etudes. It has a nickname uh, called the waterfall, and... Um, Claudio Arau, I think it was said that uh, it's a waterfall because of all the tears that have been shed over it by people trying to master these very rapid, rapid arpeggios. Well, here is Rosenthal who can sit back from them in such a way that they go absolutely at the metronome speed 
not a note out of place, but actually enjoying it, smiling at you, and you'll notice in one or two instances just withdrawing from it, when you could be more and more barnstorming, and when all pianists with a technique to do it nowadays do storm away from beginning to end, he just suddenly drops back and says, and look here, I can play this very difficult music also very quietly. And at the grander moments, instead of milking them, there's only one moment of milking a, a transition in the whole piece, and he does it again a little amusingly, and the whole thing then, then, then goes out. A perfect example, I think, of how, how to show that you can smile at yourself and enjoy the virtuosity of the writing rather than just saying what a wonderful, loud and fast pianist. <laughs> last few notes when you actually arrive home. He has this very 19th century trick that has been, I think, not used for a long time, of sitting on the last note of a showy piece for a long time. That's to subdue the people who are ready to stand up and shout bravo on the last note. He just holds and holds and holds and you say, well, what a wonderful performance. <laughs> um, I think we have time for some questions that can be... Uh,